Welcome to Terror in Tandem, a podcast about finding entertainment in the macabre. Hosted by the knowledgeable and lovable Laura and Richard Mathiason. Each episode, we discuss the horror genre, from books to film to TV and beyond. Sometimes even from the beyond. You can find us online at terrorintandem.com and on Instagram at terrorintandem. Hello. Hello. <laughs> what are you talking oh, about boy. today? That is abrupt. Oh, I mean, it is. You're right. You I just, just jumped, launched left myself, left and bound, face first. How are you? I'm great. Yeah. Um, you know, just uh, a little, coming back from a little bit of a a, a break. Little Deathless Raven told me that you have a cold. Well, my sinus and my sinuses have not been kind. Hmm. Um, but you know, here we are. That's the real horror, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, sinus infections, mucus. Oh, I mean, <laughs> gross. It's an, Sorry, everyone. Uh, it's a trigger. Do you think warning. they'll ever come up with another word for that? Like the that mucus will become so intolerable to people that scientists will be like, look, now it's called no because isn't it daisy spit isn't mucus a good example of onomatopoeia <laughs> i guess it could be yeah, yeah i mean <laughs> yeah yeah it's sort of like i mean i think that it comes from snails yeah originally oh, that makes the sense. term mucus yeah mucosal that's or, another good word or also like a larva caterpillar situation welcome to mucus mentions starring laura and richard why do i have to be starring just richard starring richard featuring laura occasionally making an appearance princess of phlegm so yeah you'll you'll tell maybe you'll tell that i'm a little nasally but here we are a bit stoofy we're we're dedicated to our craft yes we want to provide you with the the most uninterrupted entertainment of all things horror. Except for the many times that I interrupt. Exactly. Well, I meant the I don't think listener. I ever Are you just trying never to find happens. an opportunity to interrupt me? I'm making my own opportunities nowadays. Yeah. Um, endless, endless uh, avenues. Um <laughs> Well, one of the things that uh, I wanted to mention was, uh, you know, as we as we move into the end of the year, we're going to have some um, episodes wrapping the year end up. And uh, just reminder to uh, make sure you're following us and give us a like. Absolutely. Uh, five star review. Uh, nothing else. We've got. Some... Don't give us anything. other than five star <laughs> review. We're, we're, we're just entirely too fragile for anything less than than copious praise and five star reviews but feel free to send us a, a dm at uh our instagram at, at terror and tandem terror if you have tandem. any um ideas for uh episodes you want us to cover or make you know, remake any, ideas yeah any ideas yeah. we'll 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 probably most likely ignore them <laughs> do what we want to do but feel free to send them anyway. But we'd love to know that you are are listening. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Jokes aside, that's that's absolutely true. Um, so today we thought we'd bring you something really fun and entertaining, something for the whole family, something for the kids especially. We're going to talk about clowns. Cla- oh, who doesn't love that? Who doesn't find just pure awe and wonderment? And pleasure and joy in clowns. Well, I think that, you know, um, this is what we're going to really talk about is where did the fear or the horror um, element around surrounding clowns came from? Yes, because... It wasn't always this way. No, no. And, you know, it's... I don't... I don't mean to be a jerk and I don't mean to be you dismissive. Don't? No, I really don't. It just happens oh, okay. organically. Um, but I can't help but be a, at least slightly amused that in 2014, the American Clown Association or whatever group represents clowns released a statement denouncing Hollywood depictions of clowns as like evil and d- demonizing their profession. And honestly, they do have a point. Absolutely. On the other hand, 
I want to know if like when they were walking up to City Hall, they handed in their complaint if they wore like the shoes that that squeak when you. Walk. Well, how did they get there? How many all cars in the same car, take? one car, just one car. And there were representatives from all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I think that uh, they they legitimately had a right to do so because it all of the Hollywood depictions have been pretty dark especially since what we'll identify at least in in our opinions as as particular flashpoints in shifting cultural perceptions of clowns but all of that is to say there is an underlying legitimate and recognized phobia of clowns yeah that i think should be considered as separate from the hysteria over like a quote-unquote evil clown correct yeah there's there's a fear of clowns, but there's also being afraid of clowns. Yeah, the, the in horror. The um, proper term for it is cholrophobia, which uh, translates to fear of someone on stilts, because a lot of early clowns, especially in in masquerades and whatnot uh, during the Renaissance, they walked on stilts. Well, let's talk about the early etymology of clowns. That's a great idea. Clowning. Yeah. Um, so. Clowns have always been part of entertainment, mm-hmm. and uh, pygmy clowns once entertained ancient pharaohs in uh, 2500 BCE. Yes, uh, a lot of early clowns took the form of court jesters. Yes, um, Hopi Native Americans have clown-like entertainment wow, during really? spiritual ceremonies. I didn't know that. That's yeah. really cool. And then ancient Rome's version of a clown was a stock fool called Stupidus. So... <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I've been called that a few times. Stupidus Maximus. Come over here, stupidus. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. And also very telling to the human condition that cultures that never interacted with each other separately developed outlets for humor. But these gestures also served a dual purpose, especially in Western monarchies, um, in that they're, they were designed to keep the monarch humble yes they would uh, poke fun at their sexual prowess at their decision making they were there to keep them human Mm -hmm. um they did sometimes get executed for stuff like that crossing the line but yeah early clowns and jesters um served a very particular and necessary function yes in the in the 19th in the 18th and 19th century uh, the clown figure of Western Europe became the pantomime clown. Yes. Uh, when um, This is following the tradition of French mummery. Yes. Traveling troubadours and using facial makeups and whatnot. Yeah. And so um, it became sort of, this is where things started to emerge, where mischief became part of clowning. And as we know... Mischief is just the first step on a road to Pennywise. Yeah, and and, and the, the the confusion is um, clowns' unpredictable behavior between joy and sadness and mania. It was chaotic, yes. and it was unpredictable. And if there's one thing people don't like, it's unpredictab- unpredictability. Yes. It makes you uncomfortable. So how did the uh, emergence of... You know, the dark clown well, or the demon clowns start to come. Great question. Our understanding of clowns. I was able to find two large examples that, that predate modern times. I think you have gone deep into one of them. I have a couple. Um, I want to talk about the 1849 short story by Edgar Allan Poe entitled Hop Frog. Mm. Have you have you uh, are you familiar with that one? I am. So um, for for the listener, um, first off, read Poe. It's great. He he was uh, a a real creepy dude (laughs) who wrote some great stuff. Um, So Hop Frog is about a court jester with dwarfism who, um, long story short, he convinces the the awful king and his retinue. Um, to dress up for a masquerade ball as orangutans. Uh, Poe had a thing for orangutans, I guess. I mean, that would come into play in his later story, Murders at the Rue Morgue. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert for a 150-year-old story. Um, so, so anyway. this is from... This is from Hop Frog. So this clown, this jester, got everybody shit-faced, 
convince them all to dress up in these very furry, highly flammable costumes, and then lit them all on fire while they were dancing and cavorting. Um, And this was one of Poe's revenge stories, meaning two things. The killer gets away with it at the end, much like Casca of Amontillado was another revenge story of his. And it was inspired by his hatred of a real-life critic. Um, Quite something to, to write these violent stories and then publicly acknowledge you were venting your anger about a particular person. I feel like nowadays you might get put in jail for, for that. Yeah. Or just be CEO of Twitter. I don't know. Either one or the other. Um, but that was an early representation of the clown as a devious, scheming murderer. Someone who plotted. Yes. Now, the other example that I found around the same time period is something I think you are prepared to talk about, Pagliacci. Yeah, but I'm going to go back. Oh. Because there's something way earlier than Poe. Of course. Um, which I think is pretty important. And his name is Joseph Grimaldi. Uh-huh. So in the um, late 1770s. Uh-huh. Um, A good Until year. the early 1800s. Uh, He was an English actor and comedian. Um, He expanded the role of the clown in the Harlequinade, which was formed of British pantomimes. So the Harlequinade was a group of British pantomimes, notably at the Royal Theater, who would go around London and do comic iterations of clowning. Yeah, that's like like the... uh curved shoes with jingle but like basically what yeah. christmas elves look like they, they're called they were known as joeys huh and so um grimaldi started the concept of the white face makeup design oh all right. and he really started to emerge as that painted face clown that you are somewhat familiar with so he's credited with the makeup and colorful costumes. He's also quoted as his phrase being, I'm grim all day, but I'll make you laugh at night. <laughs> his name was Grimaldi. Yeah, you know, he, okay. He, not bad. He, he unfortunately did not have a happy life. No. I, it, listen, once you said professional clown, I can put together that this person didn't have a happy life. Yeah. He, 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 was, he was sickly. He was treated poorly. He mm. was depressed. Mm. Um Oh, and guy. he um, was known to be the inspiration from Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers. Oh, he wrote in nineteen thirty in eighteen thirty six. Wow, interesting. Yeah, then we go to eighteen ninety two with the Italian opera Pagliacci. Yes, which translates to clowns. Pagliacci uh-huh. means clowns. Um, the main character is a clown who kills his unfaithful wife during a performance. He sure does. So it's really the first inception of that dark demon murderous clown. And and upon its release was quite controversial be for its depiction of on stage violence. Yes. The stabbing. Yes, absolutely. So it was very much um sort of this growth of clowns as a reflection of um pain and anger and a hiding, you know, instead of there to entertain, it was more what are you hiding behind? What are are you hiding behind the makeup, behind the costume? Oh. Um, well, that that actually is a great segue into I think the the some of the understanding of cobraphobia. Well, I wanted to mention one, a, a couple other things first. We, we, exactly, before we get it's into a segue. That. What I meant was that's a perfect segue into whatever you were saying next. I just wanted to interrupt to segue the completion of your sentence. <laughs> I'm helpful. Um. So later in the 19th century, we started to see different types of clowns, not just the like fool or the entertainer. We started to see sad clowns, right, yeah. hobo clowns. Oh, God, the and worst kind. was the emergence of the circus and clowns that started to participate in going around to uh, circus um, events and traveling um you know, fairs and things of that nature. Now, you know, I may be speaking out of my 
behind here, but uh, your bozo nose. I th- it feels to me as you know, especially in like Victorian England and the nineteenth century, um, circuses and carnivals were low forms of of entertainment. So when you have the you know industrial class and the workers um, going to these shows, you need someone lower than them to laugh at. Hence the birth of the hobo clown, right. the raggedy clown who, you know, is always getting like kicked in the backside or rooting through garbage. And it, it was like, look at this person that's even lower than you are, societally speaking, and, and by way of means. Yeah. Um, who I who I failed to mention was um, Gaspar Deborah, hmm. who famously Jean da- Gaspar Deborah famously played. Um, he was like a bohemian French mime. He famously played uh, Pierrot, which is a, the basic character of that clown in the um, flowing white uh, yes. blousey In the poster outfits. of every Brooklyn hipster's studio apartment. Right. Yeah. Correct. And he. Yeah. The, the fake Italian poster they got at, at Target. Yeah. So it's a pantomime and comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, clown. Oh, so that's an actual person. Yeah. That's he, amazing. Uh, he would travel around um, France um, and perform different mime, mimings. Mimeries. Um, mimeries. Mimosas. Mimeries. I, think it's, I think it's mimosas. <laughs> and so what I why I wanted to bring him up is Gaspar Deperu he was charged with murder after beating oh. a young boy with a stick oh, shit. for making fun of him in 1936. Although yeah. he was later acquitted, I think this is probably a good moment in time to understand that the clown became a murderer. Yeah. I don't know if this is the earliest true account of a clown murdering someone. Well, but it is from 1936. That's pretty intense. I I, I forgot to mention in my story about Edgar Allan Poe's um, uh, Hop Frog that he based that on a real account. He he invented the whole murderous um, jester part. But in 1339, Charles VI of France held an epic masquerade ball uh, and he and his retinue dressed up like quote unquote wild men. Mm-hmm. So like half man, half beast. So they wore these big furry costumes and they were all shit faced from like a several day bacchanalia. Um and uh they caught fire and a bunch of people died and Charles the Sixth apparently survived by hiding under the voluminous skirt of a French noble woman. Wow. Yeah. So I, I guess that's one instance in when which weird fashion was was helpful. Well, uh, don't know what happened to the noble woman, though. <laughs> I'm assuming her Maybe skirt they, they was OK. It probably doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Um, well, we're going to get into, you know, how uh, in the 19th and 20th century, how um, different iterations of clowns started to appear. But let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk about clown phobia. Oh, oh. Oh. Now, we all like to dance naked in the moonlight while wearing the cured skin of our victims. But who has the time for the tanning, the seaming, and the cleanup? Not to mention the smell. Friends, allow me to introduce you to Buffalo Bill's Skin Suit Warehouse, the go-to outfitter for the modern serial killer. Revisit the scene of your grisly crimes in a second skin so comfortable you'll swear it was your own. At Buffalo Bills, every human suit is organically harvested from artisanal kidnap victims, kept starving in a well for several weeks until their skin gets nice and loose. Choose from an assortment of ages, complexions, and skin tone. For the budget conscious, check out our clearance rack of irregular or damaged skin suits, or our amazing Technicolor Dream Coat made from whatever was left in the slop buckets. Miss doing your own harvesting? Well, just send your materials to Buffalo Bills and we'll tailor any former human shell to your design. Get all the catharsis murder brings your abnormal brain and enjoy a hand-sewn suit without the hassle. Every people suit comes with its own basket of lotion, 
which should be rubbed on the skin whenever it's told or else it gets the hose again. Buffalo Bill's Skin Suit Warehouse. Put the fucking lotion in the basket. This is a fake ad for a fake product on a horror-themed podcast. We do not condone nor endorse murdering people and using their skin to make clothing. And we're back. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. So, in... in Clowns. In the 1950s, you know, we started to see Bozo the Clown. Oh, man. Yeah. Coming I, a, a part of the Howdy Doody show. So, I would say that is where, other than circuses... That's where clowns started to like reemerge in the entertainment field. Yeah, trying to maybe walk away from the stigma of being murderers. Absolutely. So um, I think a lot of the clowns of our of of the early, um, you know, of the fifties and sixties and seventies were not designed to be terrifying clowns. Oh no, I I, I this was probably a new marketing. Attempt. I laid the blame solely at the feet of two very specific people for the modern society society wide discomfort with clowns stephen king stephen king and john wayne gacy yeah well we'll get to that we will so um how did people start to develop or understand that clowns weren't for them well the, there is a, 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 like we mentioned earlier, there is a documented phobia of clowns known as cholerophobia. And although this particular phobia is specific to clowns, the characteristics of the fear are a bit more universal. It has to do largely with makeup and other uh, costumes and prosthetics obscuring the true features of a person. So much in the way when you see like really crummy CGI in a movie that de-ages a person and they, they don't look real, it's the, it creates an uncanny valley effect in which you know you're looking at a human, but they don't move or act like one. Yes. So it's a clown's manic behavior. Yes. And their urge to cause mischief they're, they're, and their love and joy for causing it. They're agents of chaos. Disruptive. Exactly. That that's another trigger for for people with chorophobia. Uh, it might be corresponding to a, um, a an additional fear of losing control. Um, the other thing is, they're very aggressive. Often, they you know clowns go into the crowd. They try they're to involve large. people. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. loud. They're loud. They're it's kind of like when you see a little kid f meeting a mall Santa and like starting to cry and you realize it's, it's just they're overwhelmed. Yeah. This is too much. They get in your face and laugh. And, you know, as we've progressed technologically and societally, clowns aren't really for adults anymore. And they're way too scary for little kids. There's just too much. They're overwhelming. Um, but the actual fear of an evil clown is quite different it's it's not a documented phobia it's more of a um hysteria mm -hmm. uh, which actually has manifested several times in our modern society in in very real ways that's essentially a summary of chorophobia um but again it, it's it's a little bit different from the representation of clowns in popular culture well, it can feed it though it certainly does. So, um, you know, the representation in uh, pop culture can feed somebody's fear of clowns. Also, is it a fear of clowns being on their own or do clowns in horror movies scare you? Those are two different fears. I think also in modern times, at least for me, there's an element of why would you do this? Who, like, what, who does this? What kind of person is a professional clown now? I mean, people that like to entertain. I, I, I don't mean to sound as judgmental as I'm coming off. You but are. It, 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 it's, it's the same question I ask about a, a, um, a, a surgeon. It's is a craft. What kind of person is capable of doing this for a living? Somebody who likes to entertain. Yeah. Um, and maybe they don't feel comfortable in their own skin. They have to put a new skin on. But they have to be thick skinned because the pervasive attitude towards clowns has been trending negatively for a century. Well, yeah. So how did clowns become so synonymous with horror movies? You know, in the uh, late 70s and 80s, 
it really started to become a, an element or a device of fear. Yeah. I mean, one early example, it wasn't exactly a clown, but it had a, a carnival type element was um, Nicholas Rogues Don't Look Now. Right. Um, I can't give it away without spoiling the ending. Well, I think that one of the key elements, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in depth, is John Wayne Gacy, because he was a real person who played Pogo the Clown um, at children's parties. And he was a real murderer. Yes. So that happened in the in the seventies, late seventies. I believe he was captured in nineteen seventy eight. Well, I think he was captured multiple times, but I mean, for ultimately good. stopped. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so he had a very long tradition of being a clown at children's parties. He has said in many of uh, his interviews that he did not use clowning as a way to lure children in children weren't really his demographic he no, had a legitimate construction design business it, of where he hired um young teenage youth men um, it, it's the very real fear though that you it, invited this monster into your home and left your children alone with him yeah um and it, that also chronologically came just a couple of years before the satanic panic hit exactly so i do think that the real serial killing of john wayne gacy and his association of being pogo the clown fed hollywood yes oh for sure i, I mean it, it it's it's a story that writes itself um, the 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 vulnerability created by a loss of trust in something that you thought was rock solid so let's talk about this a little bit. So now clowns are super common in horror movies. Um, and Definitely overused, in my opinion. I would say not always used well. I would agree. Um, and, and it makes sense, not only because of what we just talked about with John Wayne Gacy, but also childhood fears, um, that like primal fear of something that's smiling at you mm -hmm. is then in your face yeah murdering you you don't know the intent uh, of a clown because they're so they're at once familiar to you but they're also so alien and we typically associated i mean as as far as i was a kid um ronald mcdonald was like the number one clown that right. i associated my childhood with yeah from mcdonald's and you know he had a lot of his like weird friends and everything I never um, found him, like, menacing, though. No, he wasn't, but he could have been. Yeah. He could have been just with, like, a... I don't I want to use this word grimace because that's his <laughs> best friend, but, you Grimace know, was always a bad influence. With, with, it, with a sneer, Yeah, Ronald McDonald could easily have... If, if you just look at... Like, think about the image of Ronald McDonald and then put a, like, a, a, a sinister grin yeah all of a sudden think about how that makes you feel for sure for sure Listen, so there's something ham, like there's, inherent, there's, there's something wrong with hamburglar too yeah. uh but there's that's something inherent in us that the un like it's like a un, a, a mask you know we had it a mask episode it, it's it's because you can't so so much of communication is nonverbal, and when you do something to purposefully obfuscate that mode of communication you can hide a lot even yeah. if you're not intending to um you know it, it's what i think is the the what makes people uncomfortable now you mentioned john wayne gacy certainly uh this happened around you know the beginning of of america's rightward push um now i personally <laughs> I think it was a matter of timing and also a matter of artistry, but I don't think anyone's more responsible for our modern societal fear of clowns than Stephen King. No, and we will definitely get to Pennywise in a minute. Okay, but I wanted to say that um, the 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 like the jarring incongruity of the clowns are make supposed to be fun and make you happy and feel safe. And then their large, like, bumbling bodies. 
you don't really know what to expect. Yeah. They can be smiling and happy and chasing you around with a chainsaw. Yes. Um, so it's like inherently dark and disturbing. So you don't really know what a clown's personality is. Even with the makeup, you can make an assumption, but you don't know if they are a happy, fun clown or if they're going to be like a sad, a sad, um, like, uh, I have a happy face, but I'm sad inside or just, clown. just one red nose away from killing everyone in the audience. Yeah. And so um, when they, we did start to see them emerging on the screen it started to almost unmask them. Mm -hmm. I, I know they have the makeup on and it is a mask, but what's behind that? That's the question that we started to ask as the emergence of clowns became part of horror. What is hiding behind that smile? What's underneath that makeup? Yes. And that's where the real fear is. There are a few clowns we don't see under the makeup and Pennywise is one of them. So you want to talk a little bit about Pennywise? I mean... Because Pennywise preys specifically on children. So that's if, also part of it. If you that's, were to that's ask... That's a distinction of Pennywise as a horror yes. element is he goes after children Because their fear is, is more potent and Yeah, it and keeps him it. Yeah. powerful. So, um, I mean, I think if you asked 100 people the scariest clown they can imagine, they would say Pennywise or that clown from that movie, you know, something Well, from like that. the book. Yeah. I, I, but I'm saying even if they didn't know the name of Pennywise, yeah. they would know the clown. Um, I remember reading it, you know, as a teenager. I, I, I'm very, very fond of the original miniseries, although it's it's quite different from the Andy Muschietti films. Tim Curry. But Tim Curry's performance as Pennywise is so terrifying because... Now, Bill Skarsgård was great as Pennywise, but he's very clearly from the outset a supernatural creature. Pennywise, as played by Tim Cur Curry, looks like a man most of the time, right up until he doesn't. Now, a lot of that was budget constraints. This is a 1992 miniseries on TV. Um, it's got a great cast. The great late John Ritter is, is in it. Um, but uh, having Pennywise look like just a guy in a clown outfit for a lot of the movie really brings the horror right in your face like yeah. it, it, it's right in your backyard um you know you know pennywise as andy muschetti filmed him it was really cool and scary and i i really loved especially the first chapter um but like i said from the very beginning it's really clear that's a like an, an alien or a monster or whatever um so i just for whatever reason, I think timing had a lot to do with it. Um, it was released in, in the novel was released in 1985, mm -hmm. and we're talking. This is the height of the 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 Reagan years and the moral panic, satanic panic. We've we're now a few years yeah, removed and from kids being kidnapped. Yes, by strangers. There are yeah, yes. This is also coinciding with a historic loss of uh funding and and resources in mental health care in america so it's just a lot of things happening all at once yes that i don't think as a society we ever recovered from and as a result even the more rational of us feel uncomfortable around clowns right i, I just i don't see a future for it guys don't major in clownery well let's let's talk about pennywise a little bit so um if you've read the book I did. Um, it's, you know, let's forget about the, the, the movie iterations for a minute and just talk about the book. So um, it follows the experience of seven different kids as they're terrorized by it. Poor Stanley. Um, and um, Pennywise the dancing clown. So that's, you know, a very specific type of clown. He is... It's like a hammy clown. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's, like a vaudeville type, you know. Yeah. He, making um, dumb puns and jokes. And, the book yeah. alternates between two different time periods because Pennywise emerges um, every, I think, 23 years, I want to yeah, say. Yeah, he's got a cycle like a, like a, like locusts. Yes. Um, and the themes of the books, of, of it, the book, 
has to do with, you know, Stephen King's common themes, which is memory, childhood trauma. Generational trauma. Yes. Yeah. And evil that lurks underneath Maine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but also the, the, the um, he, he toys with this as well, the the concept of, of destiny that you can never outrun it. Right. Yeah. And the, it's the childhood trauma that follows you into adulthood. And yeah. then as an adult, how do you overcome this with a, a little bit of sacrifice yeah. and a little bit of That's the thing trust. about trauma is um, – the longer you wait to face it, the stronger it becomes. Yeah. He he wrote, Stephen King notably wrote this um, in, he came up with the book in the late 70s and began wrote, writing it in, in or the early 80s. Um, and he finished it in 1985. He wanted Pennywise to originally be a troll like um, in Three Billy Goats Gruff mm. um, who inhabited a local sewer. But um, imagine if we were just all scared of trolls now because of a Stephen King book. Yeah. Instead of clowns, we all grew up being a freaked out by Norwegian trolls. But he decided that the clown was much scarier. Do you know how to say troll in Norwegian? No. Troll. Oh, wow. Very different. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Duolingo. <laughs> so what happens is during a rainstorm, Georgie sails his paper boat and it washes into a storm drain. We all float and down here. Pennywise reaches in um reaches up to give his boat. You know, a co host, if I if I could, this this brings yes. me to an issue I've really been meaning to raise. Children <sighs> don't follow strange clowns into storm drains. I I say it every year. I, I'm tired of saying it. Right. Parents, do you know which storm drains your children are in? So Georgie's arm gets ripped off. Yeah, he sure fucking does. And his brother, Stan, his older no, Bill. brother. Sorry, his older brother, Bill. Yep, that's what I meant. Did I say Stan? You did. You're um, thinking, you're, oh, poor Stan. Yeah. So, uh, stuttering Stan. Bill. Yeah, Bill Denborough. And all of his other friends, Richie and Stan Richie and Tozer. Beverly. I mean, it's such a class. I remember everyone's names. That's how good it is. And they, they have they refer to themselves as the Losers Club. Yeah. They decide to find Pennywise and perform a ritual to get rid of him. Because he's been murdering children for hundreds of years in these cycles. And so lots of things happen. I'm not going to, you know, you can watch the movies you can read the book a, i highly recommend you read the book, book. the size of an suv to um, so take and your time because it's really incredible and i wouldn't want to because there's so many things that happen in the book that never happened in the oh, movie yeah listen if you've seen rightfully if so. you've seen the miniseries and the new movies there is a fuck ton in the book that never made it to either version but it's really critical to the trauma that they carry as adults and it also is a it's a fun glimpse into every once in a while you need to be reminded that stephen king is genuinely a weirdo yes he really is <laughs> he's a freak man <laughs> but again the childhood innocence that's taken and then the trauma that they return um to dairy as adults um is thematic in both the in parts one and two and the book um, so Pennywise is supernatural. He is fed by children's fear. And, um, like uh, you mentioned, um, portrayed by Tim Curry in a very different way than, um, Bill Skarsgård. Which I'm grateful for. I don't want to watch the same thing over and over again. Each has its perfect, um, you know, portrayal and elements. Yeah. I prefer the Skarsgård version because it feels closer to um, the book. Well, uh, there's, but I, I agree. actually like the Tim Curry version um, because when it came out, I had just read the book. Yes. And I felt like, oh my goodness. Like it, it, it was less common back in the eighties to read a book and to have a movie about it. And this was also before the the Stephen King Renaissance. It was a period of time when most adaptations of Stephen King works weren't that great, right? Um, and that includes the ones he did himself. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I I know that um, Pennywise has really become 
one of, if not the scariest. I wanted to know if you had a favorite Pennywise moment. Well, favorite Pennywise moment. Yeah. Oh, boy. It's got to be the storm drain. It's just so iconic. Everything about it, the galoshes, the little red rains, the little yellow rain slicker, the boat made out of newspaper, um, and then the image of a clown in a goddamn storm drain half shrouded in shadow. I, I it's it's so creepy. I remember reading it for the first time. I remember Tim Curry's version, Bill Skarsgård's version. All versions of it are amongst the creepiest things ever put to page. Yeah. Mine um, is probably when um, Eddie was mm-hmm. killed, when his, you know, that abusive, de- his abusive stepdad yeah. Yeah. Um, kills his little brother with a hammer. Yeah. And then he runs away and finds himself like alone and encounters it. And he appears to him as his li- dead little brother before... He tears his because that's what it head does. Is it preys on your vulnerabilities and, and your, your fears. fears? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was very sad yeah. and upsetting. But Aww. also, um, I would say Mrs. Kirsch when yeah. Beth goes to see yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, these are the movie representations. I um, well, since we spent a bit of time on on Pennywise, I think I'd be remiss not to bring up perhaps the other most famous clown in popular culture. Which would be, of course, the clown prince of crime himself, the Joker. Oh, yes. Now, what a lot of people might not realize, the Joker, um, which originally appeared in 1940, created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Now, Bob Kane was one of the creators. Bill Finger. Yeah, it's not a great name, but he did. Bob Kane was one of the creators of Batman as well. Um, The original incarnation of the Joker was only supposed to last for one issue, but the uh, editorial board... Um, decided they wanted to keep the character around. And the original Joker from the 40s was a psycho murderer. Uh, right. Killing people left and right, total crazy. Now, in the 50s, we're talking the McCarthy era and the censorship boards, they turned the Joker into sort of a prankster. You know? Okay. It really wasn't until um, the 1970s, uh, 1973, Dennis O'Neill had an arc, The Joker's Five Wave Revenge, that, that saw the Joker return in a darker form. And in the years after that, they really started to go into his his mental illness, mm-hmm. whatever it is. It's never been quite defined, and each writer has their own take on it. But this was the first time they started to really paint him as as dark. Now, 1988 saw a banner year for the Joker because that was when Alan Moore wrote The Killing Joke, which had the Joker right. shoot Commissioner Gordon's daughter, Bat. Uh, secretly Batgirl in the spine paralyzing her um, and then her character Barbara Gordon stayed paralyzed for th- about 30 years in the comics um, also saw the release of Death in the Family which saw the Joker beating the second Wayne Jason Todd to death with a crowbar fun Yikes. fact about that Jason Todd's character was so unpopular with the public that DC released a poll saying during this storyline when Joker had kidnapped him should Jason Todd live and the public voted overwhelmingly no. So they next issue, they had Joker beat him to death with a crowbar. Wow. And uh, it haunted Batman ever since. Um, anyway, so the Joker itself is based on a real movie, the design of the Joker. Anyway, it was a 1923 silent film called The Man Who Laughs, based on the novel by Victor Hugo. Now, in this German film, Conrad Veidt plays a guy who's scarred. And it makes his turns his face into a a, a, a permanent smiling rictus. Mm. It is not a pleasant smile. It's a very horrifying smile. Your face will freeze that way. Yeah, it's 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 very scary. But he's deeply ashamed of it. It's not a horror movie. It's actually a romance and a very a deeply sad movie. They slapped a happy ending on it in the movie version, um, but it did serve as the visual representation of the Joker that grinning over smile. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's the Joker who who I will say is horror adjacent. Yeah, I mean he's a mass murdering agent of chaos. So that's definitely, pretty horrific. oh yeah, I yeah. would ab- absolutely agree. Um, 
a, a couple of other mentions. Uh, American Horror Story Freak Show. Uh, John Carroll Lynch played Twisty the Clown. Right. He's like an enormous clown. Actually, Twisty the Clown uh, was what prompted, I believe, in 2014, the, the notice I mentioned earlier about the American Clown Association. Yes. That's what right. had them respond. Well, because he was a serial killer. Yeah. Um, he was, uh, I think, John Carroll Lynch was also in Zodiac and the invitation. Oh, he's the he's the uh, he's big guy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's in tons and tons of stuff. So yeah. he played a serial killer, had a horrifying mask. Yeah. Um and actually Universal just added Twisty the Clown to Halloween Horror Nights. Oh, yikes. Yeah. Um another mention is The Clown at Midnight. What's that? So it's a 1999 film um I... starring Margot Kidder and Christopher Plummer. Also starring Tatiana Ali from Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So when refurbishing an I know opera this, house, I know this movie. Um, so it's about uh, a refurbished opera house, and these college students go um, to assist in the you know education of refurbishing. I think they're theater kids. Yeah, one of the kids is like the long lost daughter of a woman whose mother was killed years earlier at the theater. And basically the <laughs> identical clown begins killing all these people. And oh. it's Pagliacci. Ah. The clown is Pagliacci. Hey, I'm so back. Um, it, it traces back to this theater and the trapped clown who Christopher Plummer's character is actually like conjuring up because yes. he wants to maintain yes. this murderous thing theater and christopher Plummer is he doesn't want to be teared down torn down and turned into something other than an opera house it's a role made for christopher Plummer because he has that way of hamming it up but it's not cheesy it actually has gravitas to it yeah so he, he you know he chews the scenery for sure but it's christopher Plummer, so it's very compelling to watch yeah yeah i remember that movie that's hilarious that you you found that um and then my final mention is the the clown from Poltergeist. Are we just doing Menchies now? Yeah. Are we in Menchies? Menchie mode? Yeah. I love it. Um, so the clown from Poltergeist. Oh, with the arms. Just the clown doll. The fucking clown. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the why this is so scary. So the the doll. So Robbie. The, the the male character by the way came out in 1982 so several years before pennywise yes well which was 1985 yeah it, yes yeah but this is just a clown doll no i, so I understand that i'm just saying that it's it's i, I didn't it's I, I just want to say that stephen king didn't invent our fear of clowns i just think he cemented it forever yes um, he, he reinforced that it's and, real. And made it like so that it will never go away. So Robbie is the, the is the young boy character. Yeah, the kiddo. Yeah, yeah. Um, the one who doesn't get sucked into the dimension. He's settling down for bed and he sees this oh, ghastly God. clown doll at the foot of his bed and it makes him super anxious. He tries to cover it and then he just like tries to ignore it. I don't know if, if kids today have this experience, but beloved co-host and I... Keep in mind, our great grandparents, some of them were born in the 19th century. So sometimes they'd get you a gift that they thought really looked fun, but to a child of the 80s was a horrifying this is goddamn nightmare. One of those. This is, this a is a one of those doll. toys. Right. Yes. A toy they found charming in the 19th century, but by modern standards. And it's like been passed down. Yeah. And so it's like yeah. dirty. <laughs> so Robbie's in bed and he hears a creak. And he sits upright, and the chair where the clown was sitting is now empty. It's empty, yeah. And so Toby Hooper, the director, doesn't really do much here with it, except for has Robbie look around his bed and under the bed. Yes. And then he sits back up and sees the clown sitting on, like, right on his lap, practically. I, I, I'm going to level with you. I I know it's a trope. The um, there's something there. You look away. You look back. It's gone, and then it appears. I understand that's a, a trope. It's a well worn trope. It still works on yeah, me. Yeah, and it and does. Then, so it then just then works on me. The clown basically puts his uh, arms, 
his snakes his arms around his neck yeah, he and go, drags him under he the go, bed. Go-go gadget clown arms. Yeah. Um, but this isn't all that the clown does. Later, the clown's face changes into this like frightful, grotesque, oh, I, I wish evil. the listener could see the face you're making now. <laughs> well, it's really scary because you think that the evil is gone, you know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the clown pops to life. The doll springs to life. Yep. Nobody is ready or expecting it. You're finally taking that deep breath they all think they've earned. Yep. Yeah. And and Robbie is, again, being basically choked to that death kid, by this clown doll. This fictitious child is going to need a lot of therapy. I know. Um, and so... It's basically this powerful entity that takes over the clown. You doll. move the gravestones, but not the bodies. Right. You left the bodies. Yeah. That clown was no joke, though. That was one of the... Sc- uh, aside from the peeling guy peeling his face off in the mirror, I'd say the clown part is oh, one yeah. of the scariest parts because of that Because it doesn't end, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's a clown. Yes. Exactly. And it definitely fits that... Thanks, Grandma. I don't know why you'd think anyone would enjoy this, but thank you. Well, it does. Toby Hooper does two things simultaneously with the clown doll. He incites the uh, claw phobia and also pediophobia, which is the fear of dolls or inanimate objects that look real. Oh, we're going to get into dolls in another episode, we ladies are. and gents. We can't have a horror podcast without creepy dolls. No, we can't. No. Any other clowns you'd like to mention? I do. I've got a couple of mentions that I I think I should go through. And then one deep, deep love that I want to give a few minutes to. Um, So now uh, in 2016, a movie came out, an indie movie called Terrifier, directed by Damien Leone. Just got a sequel this year. Now this is a, it's definitely a success story, the making of this film. It's low budget. I think it originally began as a crowdsourced campaign. And it has achieved a great deal of success, both within the community and at large. Um, So that being said, it's not necessarily my favorite kind of movie. And I just want to say that as a young man, which I still very much am, I just mean, you know, like in my 20s or something, this was definitely my kind of movie. Definitely, because it's a gritty, nasty, grindhouse movie gory slasher and no joke art the clown the design of art the clown and art's mannerisms uh are great they're very scary i think art the clown's look is is deserving he looks scary in the eyes yes. which is not always a thing that it, clowns have it's usually very more the mouth also unlike a lot of clowns you see has very sharp features much mm-hmm. like a like a renaissance clown. Yeah, he's not round. Yes. Like modern clowns are round but like old Venetian clowns yeah. had moon-like figures where their their chins like were Pierrot. elongated. They were sharp. Yes. So anyway, Art the Clown is great. Terrifier, if you're a fan of grindhouse gory movies with not a ton of depth but a lot of good kills, this is definitely the movie for you. And I don't mean to knock it in any way because for what it is, it is good. It's just personally at this stage in my life, I find myself gravitating towards a different kinds of kind of movie. That's it. But Art the Clown's worth a look. The movie's called Terrifier. Awesome. Got to mention Captain Spaulding, obviously played by the late great Sid Haig in um, Rob Zombie's trilogy of films, uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, Three from Hell, and uh, whatever. I'm not... Again, <laughs> bigger fan of the performance than I was the films. Um, but I want to land on, on on my favorite. And that is, of course, 1988's Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Rob Zombie? No, 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 no. Uh, this was directed by Stephen Chiodo, okay. uh, famously of the Chiodo Brothers. Now, the Chiodo Brothers are special effects wizards d- specializing in puppetry. They did all the puppets for uh, Team America World Police. <sighs> Um, they did the <laughs> creature designs for Critters movies. Mm. They just, they're they are really masters of their craft. So Killer Clowns from Outer Space, it's rated PG-13, but I want to specify that that's an 80s PG-13, which is a lot different from a modern day PG-13. This is one of those beautiful movies that it tricked a lot of parents, 
lazy parents into being like, oh, it's, it's a movie about clowns. Who gives a shit? I'll, I'll let my kids see it. When in reality... Even though it's called Killer Clowns? It, it's a, yes. It's a super dark, fucked up movie. <laughs> so the, the, these clowns, they come from outer space. They terrorize this town. Only the kids know what's going on. The parents don't believe them because That's they're a clowns. That's 80s trope. Their weapons look like clownish things. They wrap people in cocoons that look like cotton candy, but mm. they're more like spiders because they hang them upside down and suck their blood out. Yikes. The clowns themselves are horrific. It's all practical effects and latex. The Chiodo brothers are, are geniuses. So all three of them worked on this movie. Um, it's got a lot of iconic imagery in it the 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 cotton candy guns the um that the vacuum scooper that picks them up there's jojo the clownzilla and and pies made of acid that melt your face when you get pied with them like this movie's legit terrifying and it really snuck under a lot of parents radar which created like this wonderful phenomenon for people like me who wanted to watch movies like that but was but couldn't I was allowed to get away with something like Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Now, over the years, they've talked about sequels. They've been kind of stuck in development hell. The Sci-Fi Channel's been, I think, exploring uh, a TV show. Yeah. And there is a video game in development now that, that is supposed to come out. It's an asymmetrical multiplayer, you know, 4v1, much in the vein of uh, the Friday the 13th game or Dead by Daylight. Um. Yeah, but Killer Clowns from Outer Space, it's it's a horror comedy. It's very strange. It's creepy and weird, and it's got a great theme song by uh, by the Dickies. Hmm. So, I mean, I love this movie. It's it's a um, – I just want to live in a world where movies like this get made. <laughs> well, it's weird, you know? I, I did want to bring it sort of real contemporary with the latest clown, um, murderous clown in horror um, that I've experienced in – like a really delightful way and with the black phone. So, right. um, Oh God. Yes. So, you know, would have liked more time with him. Ethan Hawke's character is a serial killer and he disguises himself as a clown with a mask. And we did do a mask episode and we talked about this mask and he carries black balloons, but it is very much a clown. And, yeah, he is, to me, he uses makeup. He doesn't hide the fact that he is a sinister clown. You never are confused about is he a happy no, clown or not? No, you're right. Because even when he's quote unquote in a good mood, he's still threatening punishment. It's almost the anti colorful clown. I mean, it's yeah. almost like a black and white version of no, a he clown. He has like a stone mask that yeah. is dirty. And it, it cha- you never see his real face. Mm. Well, his real full face, actually. You know, and when you do, he's got the hat, the and sunglasses, changes, and makeup. And sometimes he changes the mask part, the mouth part, the expression, and then acts a completely different way. So he still embraces that, you know, emotional, uh, the hidden emotions of the clown. That doesn't isn't represented with the makeup or the mask. Absolutely. So I just wanted to uh, give that one more shout because well, these, that's a really great. These representations great one for me. have have recently led to phenomenon of of is art imitating life or is life imitating art at this point? Um, and in 2013, there was the the famous Sheffield. I think it was in Sheffield, or Sheffield somewhere in England. Um, pardon pardon me, my my British friends. Um, but there was a clown sighting. I think maybe Oh, in people's backyards. Yes. And it turned out to be the work of a few filmmakers. Yes. But in 2016 in Wisconsin, a clown was spotted in several places. And pictures were went viral and this also turned out to be the work of filmmakers making a short film. Right. They eventually made a feature-length movie of their experience that mimicked the response to what happened. It's huh. called Gags the Clown. It came out in 2018. I haven't seen it, but Laura Ashley Carter's in it, which that's cool. Um, so what happened in 2016, which I think we can all agree was the greatest year of everyone's life. So many wonderful things happened in 2016. Um, people started copycatting, um, dressing up as clowns, showing up places. And then the media took hold of it. And then specifically the right wing media took hold of it. And 
you know, when they do a thing like that, they start spinning conspiracy theories. So a lot of conspiracy theories about, and I'm not making this up, a clown purge started to circulate on Fox News and other right-wing networks. And that led to some beatings and some batteries, but thankfully it didn't go further than that. That's good. But for a brief period of time in what was already quite a difficult year, the news media was telling us of an impending clown purge, as in a purge of society led by clowns. Wow. And this was... Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. This was 2016, everybody. Yeah. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. We're still waiting. I mean, you can hope. Ultimate clown purge. I'm still prepping my anti-clown kits (laughs) and my traps. Which is a lot of um, makeup remover and um, push pins. Yeah. So that you can pop their balloons. balloons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we hope you enjoyed this. And I'm designing a car that can only fit one clown at a time because I'm convinced that will be their downfall. Only ride um, like bicycles yeah. from now on <laughs> um so we hope you enjoyed this hilarious episode because what's funnier than a clown right nothing nothing clown watch out well thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you next time Terror and Tandem is written, produced, and recorded by Laura and Richard Mathiason, and edited and mixed by Richard Mathiason. Our theme was written and performed by Carrie Denver, and all other music was written and performed by David Suspanic. All opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and should be taken as such. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give us a like, a review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Where's that?